All right, let's take a look at this cracked tooth and let's talk about accessing into a max molar and let's use this really kind of neat case. So this tooth, actually, let's take a look at the radiograph. This tooth was presented on as an emergency case and the you can see on the bite wing, the patient had long lost the res restoration and was now had symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. And if we take a look at the periapical radiograph, you got that this really interesting fracture right down the center of the tooth. And often you'll see those and you think that the there's a problem with the x-ray or if you're using the old uh, plates it's bent but it you know it hasn't it's actually that is the fracture so let's take a look the tooth is not necrotic so let's take a look and see if we can save this so and we're going to talk about doing a so I'm just talking with uh, one of my students here so we're going to see we don't have any probing depth so what we're going to do is we're going to place our secondary seal uh, with opal dam and then as you can see we have the rubber dam clamp still open so we need to close those up to make sure we don't get any saliva into our into our endo and also our irrigants into the oral cavity so what i've done there is to track i've taken methylene blue dye and this is literally i haven't touched the haven't touched the tooth at all this is the way it presented and you can see we've got this fracture running all the way down from the mesial mesial to tooth. So if this is the mesial buckle, this is the palate. We've got that fracture line running just through the pulpal floor or the, the roof of the pulp chamber. So we're going to check to see if this tooth is still restorable. And then likely we have, you know, if we look at the periapical radiograph, um, likely we have just a, this is probably where we've got some tertiary dentin and that's what we're seeing right there. So let's let this play. We've now... I'm going to take my endo explorer and see if uh, if that's you know soft or not. And no, it's definitely calcified material, and that's where the stain the stain uh, resided. And you can see it here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to use this long shank Munzburr. This is a number two, and I'm just going to run back and forth. So what I'm doing is I'm picking a spot between the mesobuccal cusp and the palatal cusp, kind of right here. And we're going to run, make a line back and forth and back and forth. And you can see the, the tooth is actually not that calcified. So it's going to be pretty simple to get into it. So what my dental assistant is doing right at this moment, and you can see it just up in the corner here, she's blowing air over this. So what that does is it gets all the air, the dentin debris out of the way, and you can keep a nice clean field. And you're going to see me pop into the pulp chamber right there. And what that tells us is indeed our diagnosis was correct. It's still vital, and she did respond to cold, so... Uh, that's to be expected. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to keep using my Munzburr in this situation. We could use an endo zebra, but honestly, I wanted to just use this and unroof the pulp chamber. I'll do this in some cases like this. Uh, my student was watching the preparation, so I want to go a little bit slower um, and use the slow round burr. So literally what I'm doing is I'm just unroofing that pulp chamber, and we're just doing that. So we can watch it here as we move towards, so this is where our mesial buccal orifice is gonna be. And now I'm just unroofing where our distal buccal orifice is gonna be. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna still try to keep this as conservative as possible, but we need to be able to clean and shape effectively. So I'm not gonna blow out this whole, you know, where the restoration was before. So what I'm doing here is there's two ways you can do this. There's another way you can use an endo zebra and what I did is I elected just to use a fine diamond. There's lots of different ways you can do this. So I'm just using fine diamond. I'm not using any water. You can use water. You don't have to. And we've elected to do the pulpectomy in this case because she did walk in uh, with symptomatic irreversible pulpitis and symptomatic apical periodontitis. Um, so we didn't have enough time to do a complete therapy. And we wanted to actually see if we get some resolution of her symptoms with just the pulpectomy before proceeding to finish the complete endodontic therapy because there's always a risk of you know doing the endo in these cases and the tooth fails because of that crack so this is this is what i'm going to do i usually use my this is number one so i'll open up the, the orifice open up the pulp chamber and the first thing i am going to do is i'm going to take my wave one gold primary i'm going to open up my orifices and at the same time we got a little treat we all know as dentists, it's some kind of weird thing when we get the full pulp out. It's uh, it's actually quite use it's actually useful because now we've gotten rid of that tissue, but it's also kind of interesting. Just I don't know why we just want to see we're going fishing for worms. I guess just one of those weird things we do. So we're going to remove that, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use I'm going to use I'm going to use my wave and gold file, and um, you can see how I angled that really little subtle angle 
of my mirror, what I did was I'm looking, I'm going to open up my orifices just to the cutting fluids. So most teeth are roughly 21 to 19, mil, you know, 19 to 21 millimeters long. We're going to open the coronal two thirds of all these canals roughly to two thirds. So that's like 14 to 16 millimeters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the coronal two thirds just with this wave on gold right away. I'm using the existing hemorrhage and I'm using some of the pulp tissue just as lubricants. And what I found is that after doing this for about almost 10 years now, it's a really quick way to open up those cases, get some irrigant down there, and then I can tackle my working length. So I'm just kind of going back and forth. It's really light brushing techniques. I'm actually using the hemorrhage in the pulp chamber to empty the flute, the debris in the flutes. And what this does as well, as you'll see here, is it actually helps to stop any of the hemorrhage. Once I remove that, you know, the coronal two thirds of that pulp tissue, all of a sudden the hemorrhage stops and you're not battling to try to just get your files in there. Because even I found, even if you use like an SX and you open up the coronal, the orifice, you know, that pulp is irritated as all heck and it just continues to hemorrhage. So what we're going to do here is now, I'm going to, now I've opened up the coronal two thirds of those canals. I'm going to take my number six file and, you know, I've honestly started to use a number six file routinely rather than starting with an eight. And what I'm doing there is you can see that I've made a little bit of curve and I'm actually dancing the file around according to the unidirectional stop. So it's all I'm doing, I'm down the distal buckle and some, you know, typically if it doesn't drop, there's gonna be a little hook going towards the distal. I can use my apex locator. Let's get a initial working length and let's do that for all our other canals. So we're going to do that with all our other canals. We're going to find an initial working length. We're going to get start our glide path. We can talk about that later. But really in this access video, we want to talk about MB2. Because you know, I know that what you you know is you want to look for that MB2. So one of the tricks that I was taught is if you can draw a line from the mesial buccal orifice, you can't see it here, but it's right underneath this cusp to the palatal, draw a straight line. And if you bisect that line from the, from the distal buccal, you can take a look often right around this area. Now this is sort of a, a ledge, and what we're going to do is instead of talking, I'm going to show you what happens. So I use my Endo Explorer, and I can feel a little. There's like a little, right there. I felt there's like a little, a little dimple, and I'm going to explore that. I can't tell you for sure if that's MB2, but let's take a look and see what happens. So I'm going to take my Munspur, and I'm literally just going to brush away the dentin in that spot, and you're going to see. A little white dot show up. So I'm just doing a nice light brushing technique and I'm moving it towards the mesial. So as you can tell what I'm not doing and it's totally a, you know acceptable I used to do this you can make your access a little bit bigger but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to conserve some of that dentin and look at that dot. That is a beautiful little dot. So essentially what's happened, instead of using ultrasonics, I use round burrs. The, the debris from the dentin actually collects into that little, into the little orifice. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to take a six file and let's see if we get any engagement. Actually what I'm going to do, I lied. I'm going to move that more mesially. And let's see if we can get some engagement with a six file. And there's so many different ways of tackling that. This is a, this honestly, this case was a gimme. This one was pretty simple because you you know you I felt this felt a stick with the the endo with my endo explorer, and now I'm going to take a six. You can see the curve on it, and you could argue that I don't have straight line access, and I don't. So you can remove. I'm trying to be a little more conservative on this technique. Um, I've been doing this a bit of a, you know, for a long time, but what you can do is you can, you know, if you can't get access into that, because what happens is the file comes straight out the distal, you know, op remove that dentin. This is the distal buckle. This is the palate. This is MB1 and this is MB2. Really what I was doing with that Munzburr is removing this little ledge, because what happens is you can see the MB2, as it enters into the pulp chamber, comes in at almost a 45 degree angle. So really what we need to do is we need to, again, remove that, that ledge. Because what happens is if we don't remove it, our file actually, you always, I remember doing this initially was, it's like, oh my, my canal, the MB2 is calcified. But what actually what happens is that file is hitting straight here and it can't, I mean, this is a, almost a 90 degree curve to try to get this apically. 
So by removing this a significant amount, then we can get that file to go straight down. So what I'm doing now is I'm just taking a six file and we're gonna slowly place it in there. You can see there's two points I wanna mention. One is you can see the, the difference between where we started with the initial catch with the Endo Explorer and how much more measly we removed it. So we removed that, essentially that piece of the equation out of that equation. And now we've got this curve file and I need to have a curve just because I'm conserving this amount of dentin. You can literally remove that and you'll be good to go. So we're gonna place that in the canal, get a little catch, and really we're just gonna watch wind a little bit. And it's pretty flimsy, it's like a wet, wet spaghetti noodle. We're gonna put a lot of pressure on it, just nice. It's just some watch winding. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to, you can see it in better magnification there. So we're just trying to get a little bit of sodium perchlorate down that or down that canal into that orifice. And then we're gonna start with, uh, we'll do that. Then we're gonna work up to an eight. Next, we're gonna step up to an eight file, same curve. Sneak it in there, just do a little watch winding. And all we're trying to do is little by little is open that up. And we'll take a 10 file. And they're going to repeat. Place that in there. And what I'm looking for as I'm doing this is I'm looking to see how far am I getting closer. The easiest marker I've got is just the cutting flutes on the, the 16 millimeter. So let's see how far I can. That's really what I'm looking for. I'm gauging, you can see here, that's exactly what I'm doing here, is I'm gauging to see where the cutting flutes are and where I'm at. So we'll just create a little bit more space and then I'm gonna go back with a six file down the same road. And let's see if we've made any, any difference. You can see how we've gotten a little bit further down now. We're getting close to the cutting end of the cutting flutes. And one of the tips is really if this eight file or six file just drops. We get it to about here and then the file drops. There's a high probability that those two mesial canals, 40% of the time, they're gonna join. 